Yes, of course. Uh, I also see that Tatsuya Tsukura has joined as well. Welcome, Tatsuya. Okay, so um, I will start and you should see now my screen, is that? Yes, yes, it has come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, thanks a lot, first of all, for the invitation, but also for this nice introduction. And from the length of the introduction, you can all guess now um, my age. I'm, uh, I just turned 70 a few months ago. And uh, that's why also I uh, found now, luckily we found an, a successor for my position as executive director of the Institute of Nanotechnology. And uh, I think as you are all working in uh, cluster chemistry or cluster related uh, research, uh, you will know uh, my successor quite well. And uh, this is not going forward. What is happening? Uh huh. Sorry for that. I didn't, it didn't move forward. Let's try again. You will have to uh, share the screen again. Yes, yes, I know. I, I somehow it wouldn't change uh, the slide. So let's hope it does it now. Can you see the screen again or? Yes. Yeah, now, now you can see also my successor uh, here, uh, Stefanie Dehnen and uh, me waving uh, uh, goodbye uh, to the uh, Institute, uh, not completely, uh, but I will stay connected uh, to the Institute. Uh, and I, I got a, KIT Distinguished Senior Fellow, which allows me to continue uh, to do also some of the research. And I think we also have a joint project, I should mention with uh, Radeep and with uh, Manfred Kappes, which we of course will continue. So I will have access uh, to equipment and we can continue to do research also on assembling materials from clusters, what is the title of my talk today. Uh, in addition, I, uh, I decided that I will uh, look also for other new challenges. And so um, I linked up with the University of Oklahoma uh, and uh, I will have a position there as a distinguished materials visiting professor. And I will spend about six months a year, but in different slices distributed over the year, I will stay in, in Oklahoma to help them to build up a materials program of higher visibility and with strategic subject and also establish a graduate program in material science. So that's kind of my new challenge. So uh, in the future, you might see uh, more often the KIT logo and the OU logo uh, in parallel, because I think there will be also strong collaborations being established between the two institutions um, in the future. So let me come to, um, to the subject uh, of today's talk. And uh, I looked a little bit back and please uh, excuse if I do it a little bit in, in the area uh, which uh, I was connected to and I still connected with in the material science field. And uh, so I don't want to step on anyone's uh, uh, foot here by maybe uh, overlooking something else. But um, there was in the uh, 80s and 90s, um, several publications which uh, highlighted the term cluster assembled nanophase materials or nanophase materials assembled from atom clusters. And there was even a DOE, a Department of Energy report on research opportunities on clusters and cluster assembled materials. And this panel report was done by a whole group of well-known scientists in the United States, and I think even some foreign members. Um, what is uh, intriguing, if you look at these papers, is that it more addresses the area of this, what is called here nanophase materials, 
Sometimes it's called nanomaterials. Some other times it's called nanocrystalline materials. And the building blocks in all of these were actually uh, particles which are in the size range, let's say, above 10 nanometer. And I think I don't have to teach that to this community. I think we all would not call particles of that size uh, clusters. So I think people have uh, kind of not clearly defined uh, uh, the, the, um, the areas or the dimensions, et cetera. And they have uh, used the term, at least in that time, uh, as I would call it a little bit incorrectly. Uh, that is not uh, a catastrophe because the content of these papers is very well, uh, is very important, but um, we do not, uh, we should not confuse it actually with uh, what maybe you and uh, what I would like to achieve when I say, let's assemble clusters into a functional material or in a material which has a function. And uh, so just to um, distinguish um, where clusters, in my opinion, at least are located in the, in the size range, uh, certainly it's somewhere between atoms or molecules and the bulk. Uh, so on this end of the scale and on that end of the scale. And I would call uh, nanoparticles, what we have just seen uh, uh, earlier in the last slide, what is uh, represented here. I mean, these are uh, different entities here only shown schematically, um, and their size range is in below, let's say, 100 nanometer, but also typically at that time, not smaller than 10 nanometer. And the clusters, uh, for example, the uh, atomically precise clusters, which uh, Pradeep and others prepare, these are much smaller entities. They contain a lot less atoms than these uh, nanoparticles. And I think their properties because of that are also distinctly different from the nanoparticles in a way. And it opens, I think, new possibilities also for the future as I would like to try to highlight today. So a cluster which is shown here, this is a result of a, a MD, a molecular dynamic simulation of an amorphous uh, cluster which contains a few hundred uh, atoms of two different elements, in this case, uh, nickel or copper zirconium. And uh, these are in the size range of one to three nanometer, which is still distinctly larger than uh, the clusters, for example, which you call uh, atomically precise. But in general, clusters are aggregates of two atoms to a few thousand atoms or molecules, and they show often remarkable differences in properties, magnetic, electronic, optical properties, than the bulk material counterparts, which are of the same chemical composition. And in addition, you can change the properties by changing the size. So they show very strong size dependent properties. And then at the smallest sizes, in many cases, you also see quantum effects. So these are just a few examples. And I don't want to go into the details of, uh, of that because this has been and will be the scope of uh, many more of these lectures in this series, but just to remind you, these are these um, atomically precise or size selected uh, clusters which are prepared by different groups, which are uh, shown here uh, as a few examples. In some cases, they are prepared by chemical routes, like the top three uh, groups are mostly working with chemical synthesis. Whereas, uh, for example, uh, Manfred Koppes, they are using a physical technique, an inert gas condensation technique to prepare clusters and then to size select a certain fraction of that, which is shown uh, over here, just with a few examples of different materials which have been prepared. And this is taken out from one of uh, Manfred's and co-workers paper. These are um, 
partial distribution functions of the different uh, clusters of the different elements uh, at negative uh, charge here. So this would be scandium 55 negative charge, cobalt, nickel, and so on. And what the group has done was to measure uh, the diffraction, electron diffraction pattern uh, to get an idea of the structure of these clusters, which were trapped in the vacuum in a so-called Powell trap. And then with the help of a comparison with DFT calculations, you can determine the structure. So what I want to say here is that we have a lot of knowledge and availability of different clusters at different sizes of, in, in terms of nanometer or in terms of atoms per cluster. And we can prepare them in a controlled way and we can manage them in a vacuum system. And I think this opens eventually a chance to use the clusters as building blocks to build up structures which would have new functional properties, which at least in part would uh, contain the uh, fingerprint of the cluster itself. So the challenge I think what I would like to aim at is similar to what has been done in the formation, for example, of thin films where you use atomic beams to use here the clusters as building blocks for building up uh, structures. Before I do that, I just uh, remind uh, everyone of a nice publication and I'm very happy that I was part of this uh, work because to me it was very intriguing when uh, Pradeep told me for the first time about the reactivity of clusters which are stable in a solution for a very long time and stable I mean if you have for example a gold 25 cluster or a gold uh, 25, a silver 25 or gold 25 cluster by itself, it maintains uh, with 25 atoms for a long time. So it's a stable species. But uh, it seems when you bring them together that you can initial, initiate, even in this uh, solution, you can initiate atom exchanges. So after a while, when you put silver and gold 25 clusters together in one uh, a solvent, then you can see that single atoms of gold go into a, a silver cluster and the other way around, and then it continues to exchange gold and silver. But at the end, you still have uh, an, a cluster which has 25 atoms. And in this study, which is a, a nice collaboration between IIT Madras and KIT, uh, this reaction steps were followed. So that's a nice uh, uh, thing to also keep in mind because it also means that we can in a controllable way change the clusters and, and form alloy clusters, which might be also important uh, for later assembling them into a 3D uh, structure in the future. So let me just uh, um, schematically introduce you to the idea which uh, I would like to follow and which we have partially already followed. So the basic idea I briefly mentioned already is to grow films using clusters as a primary building block. And the clusters are what I already mentioned are entities in the size range of a few atoms to a few hundred or a few thousand atoms. They have size dependent properties and quantum effects at the smaller sizes. And we have cluster chemistry and cluster physics as well developed fields. And we have many methods available to prepare the clusters. So the trick would be, and the challenge is how to take the clusters by whatever means they are prepared and build a film out of that. Um, I have studied uh, what has been done. And um, my conclusion is there are reports on uh, assembled um, assemblies of clusters, but there are not so many reports. So I think there's still quite a bit to be done uh, in, in this field, or I should maybe not say in this, in this area, uh, but I would hope that with a few 
uh, um, research project that one can really also establish this as a maybe small field in material science if we can find interesting functional properties of these cluster assembled materials. So what we can do is once we have the clusters, we can just deposit them one after the other and grow a three-dimensional arrangement of clusters on a substrate. So that would what I call here cluster only materials. So we would only have clusters as building block and assemble them. And in doing that, we would form, of course, interfaces between the clusters. And because we have a very large surface energy, uh, a surface area in these clusters, it is not clear whether these structures would be stable. So that's one thing which we have to study, whether, for example, if these clusters would be crystalline, a nano or ultra nano crystalline cluster assembled material would be stable or whether it would just continue to grow in size. I think that is a challenge which we have to, to look in. This is less of a problem if we go to the second uh, possibility, which is demonstrated over here, where we have the clusters embedded in a matrix. And the, the matrix is not a cluster-based material, but it's, for example, a film which has been grown uh, by atomic species, by just simple evaporation. But by co-depositing the clusters at the same time as the atoms uh, uh, arrive of a different species, we can embed the clusters into a growing film. And of course, you have a large variety of control parameters, such as the cluster size. So we can have different sizes. We can have different size distribution. We can even hopefully make them atomically precise in order to preserve, for example, quantum properties in such a uh, cluster assembled materials. We can have many different materials classes, both for the clusters and for the matrix, if we have a, a composite material. So this could be a metal, could be oxides, it could be semiconductors for both the clusters and the matrix. We can also change the impact energy because typically we can have a charge cluster, so we can deposit them in a controlled way. And we can make a hard impact, like a snowball, which you throw hard against the wall, or you can do soft landing uh, and keep the cluster intact as it lands. Of course, if you have a material like it is shown over here, you can also change the volume fraction, the ratio between matrix and cluster material, irrespective of the thermodynamic phase diagram, at least in the preparation technique. And then you have to study, of course, whether this is stable or not. Last, maybe not last, but one further parameter could also be the deposition temperature. But typically, we have chosen the deposition temperature of the substrate to be very low. So we do not have thermal motion of the clusters uh, to move them around and to have them wherever they land. And this gives you here an idea of which clusters we have studied so far. We have done amorphous clusters like these here, or crystalline clusters like these here. For example, the amorphous one was iron 80, scantium 20. This, as well as copper 50, zirconium 50, are well class forming uh, compositions. So we can grow them as an amorphous uh, cluster already in our system. We have done immiscible combinations of matrix and clusters, for example, iron in silver, or iron in chromium, or iron in germanium. But what we have also done is a miscible combination like nickel in nickel clusters in copper. So this would be, if we can stabilize that, which I will show you later, it would be something new because whatever technique you use for nickel and copper, because they are fully miscible over the entire phase diagram or, or compositional range from zero to 100%, uh, you, you would create something which you could not make otherwise. So here 
I show a little bit on clusters as building blocks for what I call advanced materials. So what you can, of course, do, you can take a substrate, an appropriate substrate, and you deposit size-selected clusters on top, and you would have a cluster-decorated surface uh, where you could now, for example, study sensor properties, or you could study catalytic reaction. This is actually a project which we have in one of our larger scale research project at KIT uh, on catalysis. What you can also do is, for example, if you increase the impact energy of the clusters, which are not even shown here, onto the substrate, you can do a surface alloy and a surface modification. Of course, it's a bit of a pity to lose the cluster property if you damage uh, it completely and you dissolve it in the surface, but you might create some interesting, very metastable uh, surfaces which you could otherwise not prepare. And what I show here and see, this is a cluster matrix nanocomposite schematically, and then here also the purely cluster composed uh, nanomaterials. And I will now kind of give you examples of these two uh, from clusters to cluster assembled materials. Uh, this is just uh, something which I found uh, in, the, in the literature. And of course, uh, one thing is from the uh, Cupus group, and they have taken C58 clusters, so consisting of 58 carbon uh, atoms, and they have deposited them uh, on this uh, HOPG uh, uh, graphite at room temperature. And because you have a large amount of these clusters available, you can grow fairly thick uh, films and uh, you can actually study uh, the properties of that. And what you see here is, for example, a nano indentation. Uh, so here is the indentation depth versus the load. And you see that increases here the load with increasing uh, indentation taps, and then you release it and you end up also with plastic uh, deformation here. But what you also see is here, there are special events occurring here, uh, which are called pop-ins, which we typically know also from uh, uh, other materials, uh, from uh, glasses, et cetera, when you form shear bands. So this is an abrupt uh, start or initiation of a deformation process, which extends over a large distance. And this results in these pop-ins in the load indentation depth curve. And what you have, what they also found the authors uh, in this collaboration here is uh, that you have a, a very high uh, hardness here in, in gigapascal. And it also depends uh, how you deposit and how you uh, post process the material and what, uh, depending on that, you can get different hardness values, which are plotted here as a function of the strain rate. Uh, another example uh, from the group of Milani was um, a complex network of memristic devices, which in this case also consisted of clusters which are embedded into a matrix. And then you can also get a particular um, uh, dependence of the resistance uh, as a function of the voltage which you apply. And this could be used for memoristing, uh, memoristor uh, applications. So there are some studies on either pure uh, cluster deposited materials and their mechanical properties, or here a functional property of a nano composite material, which in this case had less uh, control of the particle size than what um, I would like to do. So anyway, here is this again with the different material systems, but I have mentioned that already. And uh, I will not go uh, and will not show anything on, on this here, because I thought this, this is not really a fully cluster assembled material in the sense I would like to see it. I would rather have something which is actually a, a film which I could take off the substrate and, and, and look at the properties individually and not look at the gas uh, reactivity and, and catalytic properties, which is represented on the left side. 
So let me go into how we prepare um, uh, uh, nanocomposites of this type. So if you loosen the conditions a little bit, you have a whole range of um, materials uh, combination and also of physical vapor deposition uh, techniques to build such cluster sampled materials. So if you have a, a, a binary system where there is at least a partial immiscibility or complete immiscibility of the two elements, then you can just use any of the thin film techniques and you do a co-deposition using magnetron sputtering, pulse laser ablation, thermal or e-beam evaporation, etc. And then you co-deposit the two materials and they will face separate because they don't like each other. They would rather be surrounded by their own instead of with the other element. In some times, you have to do some post-processing uh, in order to get such a structure, which is schematically shown over here. Uh, what uh, we do not have in such technique is um, we do not have a good control of the cluster size and certainly of the distribution of the cluster uh, size because we typically, it's a nucleation and growth process, so we get a fairly wide size distribution. So if you're interested in very small clusters which are embedded and you would like to have a narrower size distribution, typically that cannot be achieved by using such a simple uh, process like it is shown here. The other thing is also it's difficult to control the distribution of the cluster in the matrix. And uh, last but not least, it's not possible for miscible system. If you take copper nickel, and you co-deposit it, you get for any composition or ratio of the two elements, you will get an alloy and a solid solution alloy. Okay, so uh, this uh, I would call lack of control, which would be nice to have. So here with, I would like to introduce our existing ultra high vacuum uh, system, which we call cluster ion beam deposition system which we have set up a few years back in uh, one of my uh, PhD students' uh, thesis. This was Arne Fischer. He started from scratch. He spent about 700,000 euros. And I had a lot of confidence in him to give him the money and, uh, and he deserves you know, to be uh, the initiator of this uh, instrument here. It's, it's quite large from this end where we have the cluster source to the magnet and then to the deposition chamber, which is over here, it's two by two meters approximately. So when you look at the details, what we have over here and who has visited uh, Manfred's lab, this is a, a cluster source, which is a copy, uh, but with, uh, per with uh, permission of the group in Freiburg, we have copied that in our machine shop. This is a cluster iron source, which consists of a sputtering head. So we do sputtering inside this chamber and we can control the gas pressure in here. We can control the distance of the sputtering head to the exit holes uh, in the, uh, towards the high vacuum or ultra high vacuum. And you have a lot of pumps here in order to uh, get the pressure which is here 10 to minus two, 10 to minus three millibar, to here 10 to minus five to 10 to minus eight and nine as you go down the beam line. So here the clusters are formed and they exit here through a small hole and uh, to a large fraction they are charged. So we can manipulate them. Uh, and uh, the first manipulation we can do, there is a time of flight mass spectrometer so we can determine once we have the source running, we can determine the size distribution, and then we can change it by modifying the synthesis or processing parameters, uh, or we can determine it and, and go about that. And then we have here already a first deposition stage where we work with the clusters in their initial size distribution, and we can change the impact energy uh, of the clusters on a substrate. And uh, this I will show you 
in a little moment for a cluster assembled metallic glass. And in order to protect this reactive film, we have over here another small evaporator. We can put a protective layer on top of that. And then here we have a bending magnet where we can now size select or mass select the clusters, and then we can accelerate them or deaccelerate them before they come here into the second deposition chamber, where we can either deposit the size selected clusters by themselves, so without a matrix, or by using an E-beam or an effusion cell, we can deposit them into a matrix. And then finally, we can transfer the sample to a surface analysis and STM AFM system to do a first characterization of the structure. This is a schematic of the system. Uh, the source, here we have the, the skimmer and so on, and this is a beam shaping elements. So we get a beam either we can deflect it here, first deposition unit, time of flight, the bending magnet, and then we can form a beam here, which we deposit there. And the beam can be scanned across uh, the substrate and then we deposit what is indicated here with a green arrow, some other element. So this has been published in 2015. So Arne Fischer started, I think, with his thesis in uh, 2012. This is a 3D image of the whole setup. So it's all uh, ultra high vacuum, except for the source, which is high vacuum. And now what we can do is we can, whatever we can vaporize, whatever we can sputter, in the source, we can get a cluster. And whatever we have in the second deposition chamber here, what we can evaporate by an E-beam or by uh, a thermal evaporation, we can use as a matrix. And then we can change the cluster fraction in our nanocomposite from basically zero to 100%, uh, depending on the, uh, on the ratio of the two fluxes of atoms and clusters. We can have this, what I mentioned already, the cluster size and the distribution, and we can use a, a cluster deposition uh, uh, energy. We can also vary uh, as we go. So here you can see how the cluster beam in the second deposition unit over here is shaped, and we can uh, deposit it over here. And then at the same time, we have the matrix atoms uh, coming and uh, building this cluster matrix composite. So let me show you a first example, and this is iron clusters in chromium. Before that, we had done iron in silver, which is again a fully immiscible system, but there is no magnetic interaction between um, iron and, and silver. It was just a proof of principle whether we can prepare something like that. With this experiment, we wanted to do a little bit more magnetic characterization. So we built a thin film, which consists of an iron, which is a ferromagnetic material, into chromium, which is an antiferromagnetic material. And what you get if you do something like that, for example, in a thin film, where you have a layer of iron, just no clusters here, but a layer of iron and a layer of chromium, you can even build it up as multi-layers, you get an exchange uh, bias. So these magnetic layers are interacting with each other, and that you can see that the hysteresis loop is shifted to one side. And this is called the exchange bias field, which describes this interaction of the two layers uh, by the different magnetic properties of it. What we wanted to see is when we introduce now iron clusters into the chromium, what kind of behavior uh, we would uh, obtain. The result is, is nice, but it's not spectacular different, I should mention. Uh, we did a series of iron clusters uh, in chromium with a variation of the cluster size and also the number of clusters uh, in the matrix, so the density or volume fraction. And here are the sizes, 500, 1,000, 2,000 atoms per clusters. And then it's, of course, a certain size distribution, which we obtain over here. And then, depending on the volume fraction of clusters which you put in there, you get 
different nearest neighbor distances between the ferromagnetic clusters which we put in there. So depending on the volume fraction, we get uh, three to nine nanometer uh, spread. So if you put a large fraction of clusters in there, then you are more in this situation here where the clusters are two to three nanometer apart. And in the other case, they are nine nanometer apart when the volume fraction is smaller, or here you have a different size. And then we measured the exchange bias field, just in the same way I just described it for the thin film. And you can plot it here as a function of these nearest neighbor distances, which are calculated uh, fractions from an average distribution of equal sized uh, clusters in the matrix. And what you see is that there is a dependence on the cluster size, but this is also uh, expected. And, uh, and then uh, there is not much of a difference uh, for the different uh, volume fractions or distances between the clusters. And um, if you plot that over here as a function of the inverse radius um, of the clusters, you see there's also again this dependence, but this is very similar to what you would observe if you take, instead of the, the radius, you take the thickness of these multi-layered films. So that's what I said before, it's not a spectacular new result, but it's the first time that we could uh, control the cluster size in a narrow uh, range and do these measurements which we have. So um, to the best of our knowledge, this has never been shown for such a cluster matrix system, but it also, uh, in that stage of our work on this, it was important to demonstrate that we can prepare such films. But uh, now more recently, in a collaboration with a group at NIST in Boulder in Colorado, uh, Emily Ju and uh, Mike Schneider uh, at NIST, uh, we uh, worked on cluster composites in the way I just described it for quantum devices. So the group of uh, Schneider and Ju, they are interested in exploring uh, synaptic properties of magnetic Josephson junctions, which consist of a barrier, in this case, of amorphous germanium, which contains size-selected iron nanoclusters, and the whole thing is embedded between two niobium electrodes. So here you would see the niobium electrodes, and in between you see the clusters, uh, which are either magnetically oriented or they are ma magnetically disordered. And depending how the uh, clusters are ordered magnetically, you get different IV curves. And this is exactly what they want for this magnetic Josephson junction application. And the nice thing is that we can also control the magnetic order uh, by the process which we use uh, to, to uh, prepare or to, to, um, to handle with the film. And one thing would be to create disorder, so kind of this state here, by zero field cooling. So you take a sample from room temperature, you go down to a few Kelvin without a magnetic field, or you order it with a magnetic field. But what they have also shown is with a very small electrical pulse, which you send through these um, superconducting uh, niobium uh, electrodes, you can induce ordering as well. And this allows you to change the properties of, um, of the film uh, by uh, um, an electric pulse. And this is important to use it in that application. So this was a very first uh, um, uh, work and collaboration, but we are continuing on that. This has been published recently in Journal of Applied Physics. So if you're interested, you can read more about it. And currently uh, we are uh, exploring other material systems with them um, to see whether we can induce similar or even better performance in this application. Anyway, so that's a completely different uh, field but it would show that there are, I think, applications of such structure uh, possible in fields which are very uh, um, en vogue uh, at this time.
So in order to, um, to test uh, the capabilities of that system, the code deposition of clusters and uh, of the matrix, I asked uh, my student Gleb Biankovic to test it uh, using a fully miscible comp uh, system. There are several systems which we uh, had in mind, but this one nickel and copper is really the standard system that every material scientist knows for full miscibility. And uh, it, in addition, uh, because nickel is of course a magnetic, has a ferromagnetic property, we can also use uh, magnetic measurements to learn about the cluster, about the cluster size and the cluster size uh, distribution. So this gives us, in addition to other techniques, which I will show you, an additional property related technique to look at the clusters. And here is just highlighted again what we do. We deposit the clusters which are preformed, and then we uh, co deposit the matrix, in this case, the copper from an atomic source of copper atoms, in this case, in the fusion cell. So this is done uh, in parallel and depending on the ratio of the two fluxes here, we can change the composition. And we can also change, of course, the size. So nickel clusters in copper would be metastable because here is a phase diagram and you see it's fully a miscible uh, system here. There is some indication which people have reported of a spinodal decomposition at very low temperatures. This cannot be really achieved by thermal treatment anymore because the temperature is too low. So diffusivity is small. So people have done that by uh, under an irradiation environment. So you create radiation enhanced defects in order to get the atoms to move. But this is outside the range of uh, our uh, compositions. So nickel as a ferromagnetic material also allows the study of the size and size distribution by the measurement of magnetic properties. And we have a variety of methods which we use for structural characterization, for example, by TEM or by atom probe tomography. So here is a sample configuration. We take an oxidized silicon wafer. We deposit a buffer layer of copper to separate the nickel, which could also react with silicon. Uh, we protect it from that. And then we have this cluster a sample nanocomposite, and then we cover it again with copper also to prevent reactivity with the, um, uh, with the environment when we take the sample out. So um, this is deposition parameters. We changed the nickel concentration from 1.9 to 22 atomic percent. The sample of substrate temperature during the deposition was held at minus 130 uh, Celsius. And then the deposition energy was around 60 EV per cluster. And these are the techniques which we use for structural um, APT uh, characterization, squid magnetometry for learning about the magnetic properties and also um, physical property measurement system for magneto resistance of this material. So let me first show you what we found in the atom probe tomography which is a technique where you prepare a very fine tip. And this is in nanometer up here. So the tip radius is uh, 50 to 100 nanometer. And then you apply a very high uh, electric field. And then you can field evaporate atoms. And they go through a, a time of flight mass spectrometer. So you identify what species it is was. And by the position where the atoms or the ion land, you can learn where the atom came from on the sample. So you can then later trace back where the atom came and what kind it was. So you have a 3D compositional arrangement uh, of the atoms in your material in the tip. So first of all, if you take uh, one of these samples, you see here we were aiming, uh, or what we measured was 79 to 21%. Uh, we have very little carbon and also very interesting. Uh, we are very clean in a way with uh, oxygen, considering that the clusters are formed in an inert gas atmosphere and then they travel in ultra high vacuum for four meters before they are deposited. So we have a very good control of the composition here. This is now 
a different sample which, which has 2.6 atomic percent and uh, and and then uh, you see up here the tip and you see one of uh, the elements uh, here the nickel is highlighted here in gray and the white one would be the uh, matrix but this is just a, a projection uh, onto a plane of the particles and here you can see in color code uh, the the particles inside a matrix yeah go forward again oh yeah so here uh, believe it or not uh, the student club he planned for 2.5 and here for 20 so we have actually pretty good control and we can reproduce results so that's a nice thing also about the system that we can do that so now we can actually determine the local composition and what you do this is now computer uh, analysis of the of the data and uh, you see here uh, in, uh, oh, my mouse is gone. Okay, you see here uh, the green blob, this is um, a particle, or I should say it's a surface which corresponds to a certain composition of the nickel. So you could set this to 50 or 70 or 90%. And of course, the higher you go, the smaller this particle becomes as you can assume that there is some dissolution already of the, um, of the nickel into the copper and also the copper can go into the nickel, even at the deposition and uh, the treatment afterwards of the sample to prepare the tip, etc. But still there are regions where the nickel concentration is 100%. So this is good news because we can prepare um, a cluster assembled material where the clusters remain intact, uh, even of a system which is completely uh, miscible. So here you see uh, in, in yellow where the cluster is located and the other one where the matrix is located. So there is, as you follow that green line, you see that there is a transition range between the cluster and the matrix, which corresponds basically to a diffusion profile already, even in the as prepared material, but there are regions where we have 100% nickel uh, still left uh, in this cluster assembled material. And then you can do, of course, squid measurements. Uh, you measure uh, the magnetic moment as a function of temperature. You can do that in zero field cooling or in field cooling mode. And then you can determine something which is called the blocking temperature. This describes how two isolated particles are interacting with, with each other magnetically. Yeah, so if they are very far apart, they don't notice each other, but once they get closer, they start to interact. And depending on the strength of that interaction, also the, um, the uh, reorientation, of course, of the magnetic uh, moments in the clusters will be uh, different. And this you follow by this approach, which is standard in squid measurement in this VSM vibrating sample uh, mode, uh, that you do zero field cooling, field cooling uh, measurements. And from that, you can determine the blocking temperature, which is shown here as a green dots. So TB is a blocking temperature. And you, you see that for a large range of the nickel concentration, basically from two to almost 10%, where there is no data point, but at least to 8%, there is no change of the um, uh, blocking temperature as a function of the uh, nickel concentration. Though there are more and more clusters because the cluster size is fixed by our synthesis uh, parameter. There is no uh, change in cluster size, but there is a change of the distance. They become closer and closer as you go to higher nickel concentration, but they're still not interacting. And the interparticle distance is plotted here in red. So you see in that range up to 8%, you are somewhere between, let's say, 6, 7 nanometer to uh, 10 uh, to 12 nanometer of distance. But once you go above this 10 atomic percent or go below 5 to 6 nanometer in distance, then they start to interact with each other and the blocking temperature goes up. 
And you see it goes up from three Kelvin to almost 11 Kelvin as we approach the 22 atomic percent. So there is um, here uh, highlighted uh, in, in green. Now there is no dipole-dipole interaction because the clusters are too far apart. And here we have an increase in the domains as the clusters form agglomerates. They form magnetic agglomerates. So several of these clusters are now linked together, even though are still separated by the, by the matrix, but still they magnetically uh, are interacting. And we talk about magnetic agglomerates. That doesn't mean that we have really clusters already touching and forming agglomerates, which could of course also happen. So here is basically the evolu evolution of the structure of nickel 2000 atom clusters in a copper uh, matrix. So um, if you look at the nickel, nickel uh, neighbor distance so of nickel nickel pairs, you can distinguish them. Let's say all the nickels are purely in nickel clusters. They have not dissolved at all. Or the other extreme would be we have a random solid solution uh, completely dissolved. And then somewhere in between the dissolution starts. So now if you take the as prepared material and you do now the statistical counting in your APT measurement, you can uh, get the what is here as prepared counts in the black curve on the left side. And you can compare that with the randomized counts if you take all the nickel and randomly di distribute it and you calculate uh, what would be the statistical distribution and that would be the randomized counts. And you see clearly there is in our measured uh, sample, this is not randomized. And this corresponds to all the what I showed you earlier. Now, if you anneal the sample at 275 degrees Celsius, some intermediate temperature, of course, nickel and copper start to interdiffuse. And now what you see is that the green curve is now the measured nickel nickel pair distribution and it becomes already closer to the randomized counts which is identical to the other curve on the left figure and then if you go to higher and higher temperature at 450 degrees each time it was annealed at uh, for two hours you see that it basically overlaps for the blue curve with the red curve which means we have a solid solution of nickel in copper yeah so we have a very clean obviously surface also, once the temperature becomes high enough, co uh, nickel and copper start to interdiffuse. And roughly this is also what an extrapolated diffusion coefficient from higher temperature would tell you in this range of temperatures, this is what should happen. So now we look at the structure after we have interdiffused it at uh, 450 and we see we have formed a solid solution, very uniform, random, and the oxygen level is still very low. You see that on the right graph at the line, which is basically at the x-axis, and you see that the nickel and copper is basically homogeneously distributed. So over the, the entire sample of film thickness, all this was fully dissolved. With that, I'm at the end of this, I would like to share one more thing. What would happen if we um, think about ways of preparing metallic glasses in a different way. This has been a subject all the 18 years I was at INT, and this has led us to the field of nano classes. Typically, metallic classes are prepared in alloy systems of two, three to five different elements, and they're rapidly quenched from the molten state. Then you do some solid state relaxation, and uh, you get a homogeneous atomic structure. The elements are homogeneously distributed in the sample. But you always go from a high temperature to a low temperature in very short time here, 10 to minus six seconds. And if you have more complex alloy composition, you can slow the cooling in order to get still an amorphous material. But the idea which originally came from Herbert Kleiter uh, in the 80s even, he tried this in one experiment. He said, what happens if we take uh, amorphous nanoparticles of let's say 10, 20 nanometer 
and we compact them, would we still get a homogeneous structure or do we get something else? And it turns out we get something else. We get a nanoclass, which has now between these particles, which you see here on the left side, you have now an interfacial region, which has been found to consist of a different amorphous structure. Not only is the structure different, but also uh, the properties are different. Mechanically, they become ductile instead of showing brittle fracture like the rapidly quenched glass. Um, we also have seen that there are magnetic properties which have changed drastically uh, if we do this compaction process. And the idea was now, once we, if we make the cluster, the particles which we assemble smaller and smaller, then the fraction of this interfacial region which I just described should become larger and larger. And so we tried this in our first deposition stage. So we deposited amorphous clusters of iron 80, zirconium, uh, scandium 20, iron 80, scandium 20, uh, which forms easily an amorphous particle, which then was in a cluster state, so very small clusters, and we deposited them with different impact energies. So kind of we smash them hard on the substrate so they can spread out and rapidly quench again, or we do soft landing and we hoped to build interfaces in between. And this is kind of what we are trying to do. This is what is done by compaction. You start with particles, let's say 10 nanometer, and you consolidate them and you put a high hydrostatic pressure on them and you form this lighter blue interfacial region which is structurally different, but still amorphous. And it's also responsible, for example, for changed magnetic properties. So the idea was, if we go to smaller particles, let's say to five nanometer, the fraction of this interfacial region should go up. And if you go smaller, it should further go up. And if this structure of this light blue amorphous phase, it's stable in itself, maybe it would be possible to make something like this, where this darker blue rapidly quenched structure would not even be there anymore. And I think this would be a beautiful result because it would show that we have missed over decades that the amorphous structure is much, has much more variation than was ever anticipated. So that's why we tried, instead of doing a mechanical compaction, we did the impact of the clusters on the substrate. And this is shown here very schematically out of this paper, which was published in Materials Horizons. You see in this uh, schematic, here's a cluster source and we extract the cluster beam. And now we can uh, build a film of clusters only where the clusters are always identical, but the deposition energy can be soft landing or hard landing. And then we can easily look at the magnetic properties and there is a Curie temperature. So the transition from ferromagnetic order to paramagnetic uh, uh, behavior. And this kind of uh, is given for this iron scantium system at that composition for uh, uh, um, a Curie temperature, which is around 225. And as you can see here in the graph, which I show in a minute again, uh, you see that the temperature at 500 EV cluster size is actually exactly where we would have it for a rapidly quenched material. So we smash them hard enough on the surface, it's rapid quenching and we get the structure of rapid quenching. But then we see that as we decrease the impact energy, we have lower and lower uh, uh, curry temperature. So there is uh, less of a magnetic ordering in, in there or less strong magnetic ordering. And you see the uh, curry temperature can be up to 50 to 60 degrees Kelvin low. We have also done uh, uh, exops measurement to learn about the environment of the iron and of the uh, scandium atom. And what you see at the top here is kind of a, a, a environment, atomic environment of iron and scandium, scandium at the top, iron at the bottom for the different impact energies where you can see that the number of nearest neighbors is different and also the configuration is different. And this configuration for the 500 EV is basically identical what we find also in a rapidly quenched from the molten state 
rapid pigment material. So this is summarized here again, the uh, um, magnetic moment versus temperature curve. So you see nice, there's a shift of the TC. And on the other uh, right side, you see the combination of the local motifs, the structural building blocks of the, of the class versus the Curie temperature. So it allows us to form a new class structure and we have control over the formation of that uh, by changing the size of the particle, changing the uh, impact energy and so on. So that is nice that we have a, a means of changing the size. One a student of mine, uh, Pranis Chila Kalapudi, and recently also this work was published in Acta Materialia. Uh, he looked at MD simula simulation of the cluster deposition using, in this case, copper 50, zirconium 50 clusters, another system which we have studied also experimentally. And what he did first, he looked at the, the, the structure, the atomic distribution of the atoms in such a small cluster, which is three nanometer in size here. And what you see is that there is an enrichment of, uh, of copper at the surface of the particle. So it's not a homogeneous particle in terms of composition. There's always some segregation to the surface. We have to keep this in mind because later the surface becomes what interacts with the next particle. So you have the formation of the interface over there. Then he also looked what is shown on the right side on the impact of a single cluster at different impact energies. And you see the difference between soft landing, medium landing, and extreme hard landing, where at the later case, you see that the atoms are almost completely intermixed with a, with a substrate, whereas in the low deposition energies, we keep the clusters intact. And you can imagine that that all plays a role in this uh, behavior. So this is uh, a video which uh, shows, and we have chosen um, an array uh, which would not represent exactly what we see in the experiment, because here we have chosen that the clusters come uh, from, um, they land in a hexagonal array. We just wanted to optimize the formation of the interfaces, but other than that, it's a fully uh, realistic simulation. And now knowing all the, uh, the positions of the atoms of the different types, you can then also learn about um, the structure. And here we have done the same thing by compaction of the clusters. And this would be representing more what, what you get uh, by mechanical compaction. The other one is by the impact. So you can now compare the different processing routes. Here you see how the clusters are deposited on, on this top with a uh, red and yellow atoms. And at the bottom, you see uh, the distribution or the uh, potential energies of the atoms in the growing film. And you can clearly identify the interfacial regions for 60, 300, and 600 milli EV, um, uh, where still the clusters or the interfaces are visible. So we can identify interfacial regions and we can identify the cores of the former clusters. Whereas at 6,000 milliEV, everything is intermixed. And this would be really comparable to rapid quenching from the melt. And then you can further analyze it. And there's a whole literature on that. You typically use this Voronoi tessellation and you have Voronoi indices, which are shown here on the, on the right side in order to describe the local atomic arrangement, which you can then plot in atomic fraction for these different Voronoi indexes. And from that, and the comparison to metallic classes, which are rapidly quenched, you can see the settled differences. And the differences are really only settled uh, in terms of what you achieve at the low impact energy or high impact energy, but still, these small differences seem to be important also for these changes of, for example, the magnetic uh, um, uh, properties of these deposited films. So my summary, and with that, I'm at the end. Um, I wanted to show you that cluster ion beam deposition allows the highly reproducible synthesis of designed man-made cluster assembled alloys and composites. 
And this can be done irrespective of cluster size, composition, phases, and so on, as we have demonstrated for immiscible and miscible systems. But we can also go towards metallic classes, which are assembled from amorphous clusters of various sizes. And we can, you know, maybe get new metallic class structures, which we have not seen by itself by other methods. Possible areas where this could be of interest is in catalysis, which I have not covered, but in magnetism, superconductivity, quantum materials, and maybe more when you have more and more materials available, which we can study. This is a bit on future research, but in terms of the time, I think I skipped that because somewhat uh, it's um, kind of concluding from what I have shown. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, even if I was a bit long now, but I would like to thank a lot of people uh, who have contributed. I mentioned already Arne Fischer and uh, who has built this wonderful system. And then a few people which are listed here who have done synthesis or have done uh, a characterization technique. And then, of course, funding agencies, etc. So thanks a lot for your attention. And of course, I'm open to uh, listen and try to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Horst. Um, has been a wonderful journey through cluster assembled materials. Uh, let me begin by asking one question. And Tatsuya has already raised his uh, hand. Uh, one quick question. Our field is affected by one big problem that these clusters are very sensitive. Interfaces are difficult to control. Uh, and the inherent uh, problem of this uh, instability of some kind that leads to a lot of complications, as we all of us know. So I'm just picking your brain as to how would you look at this growth of this area with such materials with enormous surface energy and extreme a diffusion and such other proper issues. And the fact that these properties are highly dependent on atomic positions, which keep changing. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, this is uh, really a very critical um, um, aspect of, of what we do, because uh, we need to stabilize uh, whatever we create. We need to stabilize it when we make it. And we need to stabilize it when it's made for a long time if you want to apply it. I mean, for basic studies, maybe you can still do it at low temperature in protective atmosphere and whatever. But other than that, if you want to ever use it, for example, in this magnetic Josephson junctions, you need to have a stable uh, behavior. I mean, for at least the cluster sizes I have shown to you, uh, I. I wanted to see what happens when we anneal it. And um, what I have shown to you was even for a system which is very, uh, which is fully miscible, yeah, and where uh, it is still stable at low temperature, but it's kinetically stabilized because we could show as we anneal it at elevated temperature, it starts to interfuse. Uh, what it what it should do actually yeah and it also showed because it interdiffused it also showed that the sample purity is uh, is is very good otherwise maybe a protective oxide layer would have prevented the interdiffusion at 275 degrees yeah in the copper nickel so i mean i'm fairly optimistic that at least for some systems we can do that what happens if you go to smaller and smaller cluster sizes, what we are trying also to do with your cluster materials, where we have only 25 atoms, it, it might be even more tricky. And uh, I think this uh, needs to be answered initially by experimental work uh, and uh, to see how well we can stabilize it. Yeah, I think it's it's at the end, it's going to be the uh, determinant factor uh, if you want to go towards applications, if you find positive and, and, and uh, interesting properties and uh, that we can stabilize it. But it's a very uh, open 
I'm optimistic that we can do it in particular when we succeed in embedding the clusters in some kind of inert matrix. Yeah. By themselves, I don't know. We are doing experiments with platinum right now where we do uh, platinum clusters and we deposit them just by themselves. And I'm curious to see how fast they will grow. Yeah. Or whether we will be able to stabilize it. And, Thank uh, you. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the great talk. I have a uh, quick questions on page 21 about the structure characterization. Mm -hmm. uh, first quick question is how can you make uh, such tiny needle from the film? Oh, okay. This is standard uh, um, technique uh, in, in focused uh, ion beam. Uh -huh. um, you're using focused uh, ion beam. Focused uh, ion beam. Uh, yeah. Equipment. This is kind of standard to do that. I see. You can do it from a bulk material by lift off technique. You can do it in a thin film by uh, creating the needle. In some cases, if you have a thin film, you can deposit them on top of a needle already, of a pre existing needle. You deposit on top and you have it at the end of your deposition technique. You have the needle already. But in I this see. case, it was prepared out of the film. I see. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so if I see the uh, uh, mapping, the boundary between uh, nickel and copper are not so clear. So is this due to the dissolution of nickel to the copper matrix or yes. is yeah. this due to the limitation of the resolution, spatial resolution? So I think it's it's beyond the spatial resolution. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the width of that in that diffusing area is is larger than uh, what you would get in an atomically sharp interface. Mm -hmm. So um, there is already some interdiffusion occurring either during the deposition at minus 130, yeah, because the cluster is momentarily free at the surface before it's covered. So mm -hmm. atoms could jump on the surface, right, at lower mm -hmm. temperature even, and then they are distributed already in the matrix. And we find a small amount of nickel in the copper matrix. And this okay. could happen at very low temperatures even, temperature. or it happens during the sample preparation, mm -hmm. which is of course done with a gallium beam and, and so on. So it's um, it's it creates damage to the film. We have to admit that, yeah. I see. By the way, Stephanie Denen was with us at the Golden Conference. Yeah, she Last told week. me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. my student is now visiting Manfred level three. Ah, yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very okay. nice. Uh, my friend, you have a question. Yeah, I had a question for Horst too. Um, about the same thing, perhaps. So the, the, another variable that you have apart from the kinetic energy of the deposition is also the angle at which you put the cluster down on the surface. Yeah. And in principle, you could have lateral kinetic energy uh, along the surface. And yes. have you have you looked at the effect of that on the distribution of the nickel in the copper, if you if you vary that angle of incidence? Uh, um, no, we haven't done it. Uh, I, I, maybe we should do it in the MD simulation, mm -hmm. um, uh, which can be done easily uh, in the MD. Um, experimentally, is a bit harder because. Uh, of the geometry of the of the substrate and the incoming beam and that you would like to have you know the uh, atomic beam not coming in an awkward angle mm -hmm. so what we do is we we try to have it like uh, 45 degrees like that and then this is the cluster beam and the other one comes from here so the incident angle would be similar mm -hmm. and uh, this has shown the best results but this is because of the geometry of the deposition system. What yeah. we do now, uh, we build another unit uh, with the ultra high vacuum uh, cluster source. And there, what uh, we are trying to do is you come with a cluster beam and you bend it upwards and you come also with the atomic beam from the bottom. And uh, it's a bit tricky, but it should work. And, and then the, angle would be um, in at least 
fixed in a different way, but it would um, maybe prevent that momentum along uh, the uh, substrate plane. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. But it's a good point, Manfred, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thomas, you have a question? Thank you. I'm enjoying the series of talks, and this one was another wonderful talk. Uh, I have a, I have like three questions that are maybe slightly related to also to what Pradeep said. Uh, can you comment on how, to what kind of thickness you can go towards the minimum thickness of these layers, and also which is which relates to it, which relates especially to aspects of soft landing and hard landing of the clusters mm -hmm. because i'm sure that the layer that you're depositing the layer of clusters you're depositing depending on whether you use soft landing or hard landing it changes the adhesion of the layer to the surface can you in relation to this can you comment on possibility to detach especially very thin layers from the substrate and then on, which is a kind of another related question, on the stability of these very thin layers once you remove them from ultra high vacuum. Mm -hmm. I mean, to answer your last question first, uh, I mean, what we have to do in many cases, we have to protect the film at the end with something inert. Um, otherwise, you know, it starts to oxidize because we have interfaces where oxygen can penetrate. Uh, we have reactive materials like iron, scandium or copper zirconium. I mean, if they get in touch with, with air, uh, they will instantly uh, react. So we have to avoid that because otherwise you measure something completely different. Yeah. So we do that uh, if it's necessary. Um, but for example, your point with uh, if you can detach it, we have done that in many other cases in thin film deposition, where you can have a sacrificial layer of sodium chloride or so, and then you can deposit everything on top of that, and then you dissolve it and you have the free floating, for example, film for, uh, for example, for TM studies, where you could instantly take it to the TM you don't have to do any further processing. So that can be done, or you kind of etch away the um, backside of your silicon wafer. These are techniques which are established. They're complicated in particular when you have reactive layers, you also have to have a buffer layer then at the bottom in order to protect. Yeah? So this needs to be studied system by system what can be done, but in principle, it can be detached from the substrate. Mm -hmm. We try to avoid it because it becomes less stable, it's more difficult to handle it and so on, but it can be done. Yeah? And um, then to the thickness, um, it depends. I mean, in our first deposition stage, when we allow the full size distribution that comes out of the source, which is not very wide. I mean, I don't know the sigma value of this log normal distribution, but it's very narrow still. But um, uh, if you take the full uh, width of the distribution, you can grow within a half an hour or an hour, you can grow a film which has a few hundred nanometer in thickness. And then if you do a size selection through the magnet, of course, it depends how narrow you do it again. Uh, if you make it extremely narrow, it's almost nothing goes through, right? Uh, but typically we grow a film uh, of, um, let's say a hundred nanometer, which contains, let's say 10 atomic percent of clusters in it within a few hours. And a hundred nanometer is a lot in terms of let's say studying magnetic properties, electrical properties, we can easily study that on, on films. And the area typically would be, um, I think it's about six to eight millimeter in diameter where we have the deposited clusters. So it's a minute amount of clusters, is a minute amount of film, but it's possible to use it for physical uh, um, property measurements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Thank uh, you. And I was wondering whether you could go with a thickness as low 
uh, as a, like a molecular layer. So if you have like 20 uh, clusters that might consist of 25 or 40, 100 atoms, and if you can have a homogeneous, but I would assume certain problems with homogeneity of uh, and with really achieving uh, this yeah. homogeneous layer there might be some kind of holes in there as well so and the layer might not be as compact as if you grow a thicker layer mm -hmm. but with a thicker layer you're obviously getting also closer to some sort of bulk properties even right. though predetermined by the precursors I mean, what we have done using uh, platinum uh, target, we have cr uh, formed platinum clusters, size selected them and deposit them at low impact energy on a substrate, uh, for example, Syria. And this is uh, what is then studied in the TM. And this is part of uh, a large project in Karlsruhe uh, with 25 sub projects and so on in different groups on catalytic properties. And so what we are currently finishing to build is a small catalytic reactor where we can transfer this uh, deposited clusters, which are only a few. I mean, we don't even cover a monolayer, right? We only have a few. So you have single atomic, uh, sim a single clusters located there. And then we move it over to a catalytic reactor to, to see the reactivity as a function of size and so on. So that can be done, and the, the uh, partner group, they are studying that in terms of uh, TM, the structural change of the cluster when we anneal it, when we expose it to the reactant gases and so on. And uh, so that's kind of the project. So yes, you can do even less than a monolayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's nice listening to the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I see that uh, Rob Burton uh, has also joined and he was there for some time and then disconnected for a short while. Yeah. Um, um, it's a nice comment. <laughs> Clusters okay. and materials, ultras and films, always and forever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I think um, it's an interesting field, which I think, uh, you know, within this group, there might be many opportunities to to interact, uh, because I think it would also be very helpful to to bring these uh, wonderful properties of clusters and structures uh, into something which you can almost touch as in film. Yeah. And then you can apply it in, in different applications, hopefully. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, are there other questions? Otherwise, we are going to close this discussion. It was a wonderful tour uh, through uh, several, maybe 30 years of this uh, story. Very nice to hear all, all that. At some point in time, maybe that intervening period of 1990s in the beginning to today, well, Today, it is appreciated as these cluster assembled materials are very different, distinctly different from the past uh, materials, the way they, they were thought about years ago. That transition regime wherein this, our understanding got transformed, one should write probably something about it for posterity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today it is uh, any meeting you go, uh, it is cluster is viewed very differently. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 10 years ago, it was completely different. Everyone could say, any, synthesize anything and that would be a cluster. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, Horst for this yeah, wonderful lecture. And let's close this uh, now. Uh, we have uh, a short discussion Horst just after yeah. this. Thank you. Manfred, if you uh, Manfred is already gone. <laughs> I yeah, wanted to say you yeah, yeah. can also join, but okay, bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.